For all the years he worked at Blue Sky, Carlos Saldana has seldom created any of the movies the company released. However, he finally ends up getting a chance to shine when he gets the green light to make a movie based on the Brazilian city that he was born in called Rio. It's the story of a domesticated Spix macaw named Blue as he lives a content life with his owner, Linda Gunderson. One day, Blue and Linda are visited by a Brazilian ornithologist named Tulio, who brings them to Rio de Janeiro in the hopes that Blue can mate with a female Spix macaw named Jewel in order to preserve their endangered species. However, Blue and Jewel don't exactly get off on the right foot, mostly because Jewel has an independent streak and has trust issues with humans. Soon, though, the macaws get captured by a band of bird smugglers who plan to sell them off for a profit. Blue and Jewel manage to escape and are helped by other birds to get the chain the smugglers put on them off and make it back to Linda and Tulio. And in the process, Blue tries to learn to fly since he never learned to do so throughout his life, while the smugglers send out their sadistic pet cockatoo, Nigel, to retrieve the macaws. Saldana first came up with the idea of the movie in 2005, where it would have been about a penguin who washed onto the shores of Ipanema. Saldana changed it due to other animated movies starring penguins like Happy Feet and Surf's Up being released. The entire plot of this movie was actually based on a real-life event, where a macaw named Presley was brought to a captive breeding program to help keep his species of bird alive. For research, Saldana showed the animators some maps of Rio with geographic landmarks and measurements which caused them to create a digitalized version of Rio. Some of Blue Sky's artists visited Rio to see the various locations and the animators met a macaw specialist at the Bronx Zoo to see how they would move and act. Since Saldanha grew up in Rio, some of the Brazilian aspects shown in the movie were the result of Saldanha growing up there. Originally, Blue was supposed to be voiced by Neil Patrick Harris, but Harris had other commitments, so in his stead, Blue Sky hired Jesse Eisenberg to voice Blue. And this continued the Blue Sky tradition of giving some actors their first voiceover role in an animated movie. Alongside Jamie Foxx as the voice of Nico. While voicing Blue, Eisenberg was also playing a fictionalized version of Mark Zuckerberg in the 2010 biographical drama, The Social Network. To make time for Rio, Eisenberg decided to only voice Blue on the weekends and admitted that voicing Blue gave him some levity because he found playing Zuckerberg to be joyless. This is also the second collaboration between Eisenberg and the voice of Jewel, Anne Hathaway, as they both starred in the 1999 sitcom, Get Real. For the voice of Nigel, they brought in New Zealand actor Jermaine Clement to voice him after a test shot of Nigel speaking a line made by Clement's character in the sitcom, Flight of the Concords. Some ideas that were tossed around for the movie would be Blue looking more like an actual Spix macaw, Nigel being a palm cockatoo, Linda being older and named Mrs. Park, and many unused characters like Linda's aunt Alice and her cat Clyde, the mayor of Rio, and a bird minion of Nigel's named Hernando, who was most likely reworked into the character of Fernando, the street urchin who works for the smugglers. The birds that Blue and Jewel befriend on their adventure were named after some people who worked on the movie. Raphael was named after storyboard artist Raphael Zentil, and Nico and Pedro were named after two people who worked on the movie's music. Speaking of which, for the film's music, the people at Blue Sky brought on board Brazilian musician Sergio Mendes to direct some of the songs, and he was able to reach out to artists to help write some of the music for the film, like rapper and the voice of Pedro, Will I Am. The movie score was done by, again, John Powell. The soundtrack of Rio was released by Interscope Records and came out a week before the movie April 5th, 2011, for digital download and followed by a physical release eight days later on April 12th. Now, before I continue, I'd like to tell you guys about one controversial element when it comes to Rio, and that is the canceled Pixar film, Newt. Why was it canceled? Well, let me give you the summary. Two endangered newts are brought together to have their species live on, but they get separated from the scientists and go on a journey through the wild to get back home. Yep, Newt was basically a Pixar version of Rio and would have also been released in 2011, but was canceled. Strangely, it wasn't because of Rio. It was because the people at Pixar wanted to create the 2015 movie Inside Out. 
The movie had an earlier premiere on March 5th, 2011, in a small town in the real-life Rio called Lagoa, and a month later it got a limited early release on April 10th at the Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. And finally, when audiences worldwide went into the world of Rio on April 15th, 2011, it earned very good reviews from the critics and audiences. Most of the praise was given to the visuals, music, and voice acting. It also got a 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. For the box office, it earned $484.6 million against its budget of $90 million. $143.6 million of the money came from the theaters in North America, while other countries brought in the extra $341 million. On its second weekend during Easter, it surpassed that weekend's film releases consisting of Tyler Perry's Medea's Big Happy Family, Water for Elephants, and African Cats. During the advertising of Rio, Blue Sky collaborated with the game company, Rovio, and made a Rio version of their popular app game, Angry Birds. One of the Brazilian people who worked on the soundtrack, Tayo Cruz, also wrote and sung the song Telling the World for the movie, with a music video being released online on March 18th. The song has received positive reviews and debuted at number 60 on Billboard 200 charts. Rio won an Annie Award for Best Character Animation in an Animated Production and was nominated for the same reward for the categories of Annie Awards for Best Animated Feature, Best Character Design in a Feature Production, Directing in an Animated Feature Production for Saldanha, Production Design in an Animated Feature Production, Best Voice, Acting in an Animated Feature Production for Jermaine Clement, and Best Music in an Animated Feature Production. Other nominations included Favorite Movie, Animated Voice for Anne Hathaway, Favorite Animated Movie, Best Animated Film, Outstanding Animated Character in an Animated Feature Motion Picture, and most importantly, Best Original Song for Real in Rio, but the latter part was given the 2011 revival of The Muppets and their song Man or Muppet. A little over two years later on September 27, 2013, Simex Iwerks converted the film into a 12-minute 4D short film called Rio 4D, and it was shown at the San Diego Zoo 4D Theater, and at various points in the 2014 year, when the sequel to Rio was released, it was also shown in other places with 4D showings. A video game version of the movie was released on April 12, 2011 by THQ for the Nintendo DS, Xbox 360, Wii, and PlayStation 3. Rio was released on DVD and Blu-ray on August 2nd over three months later. In Brazil, the Blu-ray slash DVD got an earlier release on July 11th. Huh, I guess when your movie is set in a certain place, special treatment is kind of expected for that place in reality. The film is available in four different packages, a four-disc party edition combination consisting of a DVD, Blu-ray, 3D Blu-ray, and a digital copy, a three-disc party edition combination package that consists of a DVD, Blu-ray, and digital copy, a two-disc party edition package consisting of a DVD and digital copy, and a single-disc DVD box. The digital copy featured a three-disc combination package that comes with an hour of bonus features, including a deleted scene Blue and Jewel run through a beach while hiding underneath a fruit stand. Getting into my personal thoughts about the movie, well, I was pretty excited to see the film like I did with nearly every other film. When a trailer was released in February of 2011, my excitement increased, especially when I heard a small portion of Telling the World which I became obsessed with, as much as the film itself, that saying that I wasn't disappointed by the song would be an understatement. I also enjoyed the movie for the most part, and consider it to be one of my favorites that Blue Sky put out there back when I was younger. Rio essentially proved that Blue Sky still had the chops to make original animated films. The success that the film received proved to be as beautiful as the city of Rio de Janeiro itself. And anyone who appreciates this movie for what it is, will feel like they will be able to fly like the birds in the movie. During the Christmas season of 2011, Blue Sky made a TV special for Ice Age called Ice Age, a mammoth Christmas where the gang go to visit Santa in order to convince him to not put Sid on the naughty list after Sid accidentally destroyed a decorative rock Manny possessed. 
despite being produced by Blue Ski, the animation was actually done by some animators at both Blue Sky and by the animation company, Real Fix Creative Studios. It was released on TV on November 24th before being released on DVD two days later on November 26th. I remember liking the short so much that I watched it relentlessly and even bought the DVD. Moving past that, over a year later after Rio came out, Blue Sky once again decided to make another Ice Age sequel, this one titled Ice Age Continental Drift. Manny's daughter Peaches has just entered her teen years and she and Manny are at each other's throats since Peaches harbors a crush on a boy mammoth named Ethan. Soon, Manny, Sid, Diego, and Sid's grandmother, who was dumped on him by his selfish family, get separated from Ellie, Peaches, and the Possums due to an earthquake and use a giant iceberg as a boat. While trying to figure out a way to get back home, the group is captured by a band of pirate animals led by the villainous Captain Gut, and after escaping them, they are helped by one of Gut's crew members, a female saber-toothed tiger named Shira, to return to their family. The first details of the fourth Ice Age picture were announced on January 10th, 2010, when the New York Times reported that Blue Sky was working on the movie and was in negotiations with the cast. The original plot was rumored to involve the Ice Age gang being frozen solid and got defrosted in a museum during the modern times and would have been called Ice Age Thaw. Though, I can't help but be curious to see how that turned out. One of the biggest achievements from Blue Sky's animation was the CGI water that was used for the ocean, along with some clouds in the sky throughout the movie. Unlike in the meltdown, the water effects from the ocean were achieved by combining software, with some that were made in-house and some that were off the shelf. While water, splashes, and cloud rendering were made in Blue Sky's proprietary renderer, a software called Houdini was used to create data for simulations, and another software called RealFlow was used for some splash effects. The biggest sequence for the CGI water was mostly during the storm scene, after Manny, Sid, and Diego get lost at sea, as that scene was on the perfect scale to take on within the movie. For the clouds, the team at Blue Sky created settings in a real space so that they could be lit and also be rotated with dynamic camera movement around and through them. Getting into the characters, the biggest one who went through the most changes was the film's antagonist, Captain Gut. He was originally a rabbit, which was reworked into one of Gut's henchmen, Squint, followed by a prehistoric bear. But Peter DeSev couldn't design a bear properly, so his final design was based on a giant prehistoric primate called a Gigantopithecus. Gut was also going to be voiced by Jeremy Renner, aka Hawkeye from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, Renner was unavailable, likely due to playing Hawkeye in the 2012 Avengers movie, so he was replaced by Peter Dinklage, and this kept with the Blue Sky tradition of giving actors their first voice role in an animated film, alongside the voice of Louis the Molehog, Josh Gad. Also, Sharia was supposed to have orange fur like Diego. But the filmmakers changed this due to being afraid that the audience wouldn't be able to tell them apart. For the film's music, John Powell again created the movie's score and a soundtrack, and was released on July 10, 2012 by Vares Sarabande. Powell also included Beethoven's Ninth Symphony at the end when Scrat finds Scratlantis. Powell explained, At the beginning of the film, the creation of the geographical world as we know it seemed just such an immense idea to musically convey that I gave up entirely and used Beethoven's Ninth Symphony instead. With a bit of obscenely crass reorchestration and blatantly cheap arranging tricks normally associated with strippers, we got it to fit the action perfectly. But the cost that I must now bear is having to live forever in hiding, since the Beethoven Society issued a fatwa on me. One last interesting bit of trivia is that to promote the movie, two Scratch shorts called Scratch Continental Crack Up, parts one and two were released theatrically, with some movies like Gulliver's Travels, Rio, and Alvin and the Chipmunks, Chipwrecked. The shorts were some small clips from the movie about Scrat and his journey to find Scratlantis. Ice Age, Continental Drift, had an early premiere on June 20, 2012, at the Signorope Film Distributors Trade Fair in Barcelona. It had a more public appearance on June 27, 2012, in Belgium, Egypt, France, Switzerland, and Trinidad, 
before it was released in North America on July 13, 2012. The film was accompanied by an animated short based on The Simpsons, The Longest Daycare, where Maggie Simpson tries to protect a cocooned caterpillar from her enemy, Gerald Sampson, while attending a daycare. The film received mixed reviews from both critics and audiences. While they praised the animation, vocal performances, comedy, humor, and musical score, they also criticized the plot due to its lack of originality. It earned a 37% on Rotten Tomatoes. Roger Ebert gave the film two stars out of four and said, Watching this film was a cheerless exercise for me. The characters are manic and idiotic, the dialogue is rat-a-tat chatter, the action is entirely at the service of the 3D, and the movie depends on bright colors, lots of noise, and a few songs in between the whiplash moments. However, people like Simon Brew from Den of Geek gave a very positive four-star review, saying that not only is Ice Age 4 arguably the best in the franchise yet, it's also, a little surprisingly perhaps, given that it's a fourth movie in a franchise turned around on a strict cycle, turned out to be thoroughly, thoroughly entertaining family blockbuster. Despite this, the film ended up being a box office success, as it earned $879.7 million against a $95 million budget. It earned $16.7 million on its opening day that grew into $46.6 million on its opening weekend, which made it the second largest opening weekend in the Ice Age franchise, falling behind Ice Age, the meltdown from $68 million. There were two songs released alongside the movie, Chasing the Sun, performed by the band The Wanted, and We Are Family. No, not that one. We are, we are not your ordinary family, That's we better. Can all Performed by Peach's actor, Kiki Palmer, both of which are fun to listen to and are enjoyable. Released alongside the movie was a video game called Ice Age, Continental Drift Arctic Games, where the characters and the pirates duke it out over a giant acorn full of fruit through a series of Olympic-style games. The game was made by Behavior Interactive and published by Activision and was released on July 10, 2012 for Wii, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo DS, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360. The game got negative reviews, with criticisms aimed at how short and lackluster the game is. The movie was released on DVD, Blu-ray, and Blu-ray 3D in December of 2012. Getting into my personal thoughts with the movie, I actually love it and consider it to be the best of the Blue Sky movies. <laughs> yeah, if you don't like it, that's your burden to bear. Ice Age Continental Drift may have been at the point where some people think the franchise's quality has drifted, but for people like me, it's a continental-sized movie that is okay and enjoyable nevertheless. For Blue Sky's next film, the filmmakers decided to adapt William Joyce's 1996 children's story, The Leaf Men and the Brave Good Bugs. However, they decided that the film needed a title that's grand, a title that's bombastic, a title that's... epic. Set in a New England forest, small soldiers called The Leaf Men protect the forest from villainous creatures called the Boggins, led by the villainous Mandrake. Meanwhile, a teenage human named Mary Catherine, or MK for short, visits her eccentric scientist father, Professor Bomba, who is obsessed with finding the Leaf Men, much to MK's annoyance. Soon, the queen of the forest, Tara, is killed, and when MK catches her, Tara shrinks MK down in order for her to help the Leaf Men protect a flower pod from the Boggins because it will show the new ruler once it blooms. MK at first only takes the task so that she can go back home, but she soon comes to understand that her father was right and develops feelings for a rebellious leaf man named Nod. The film was first announced in 2006 where Chris Wedge decided to direct the film and William Joyce was brought on as a producer. At first, Fox Animation wasn't interested in the project, but when Wedge pitched the idea to Pixar, the people at Fox reversed their decision and after five rewrites of the script, the movie was green-lighted in 2009 under the title Leaf Men. As said before, the movie's title was changed to Epic by the marketing department. 
Wedge wasn't satisfied with this name change and was also dissatisfied by how the film was given subtitles in non-English countries, including the French title for the movie, The Battle of the Secret Kingdom. To anyone who has actually read the original book, you might notice that the movie is vastly different from the book, like how the plot has been changed for the movie. Wedge says that, while Bill wrote a wonderful book, it is a quaint story. We wanted to make a gigantic action-adventure movie. The leaf men in the movie were inspired by samurai, with the lead leaf man, Ronin, giving this more meaning as his name is defined as a samurai without a master. Originally, Johnny Knoxville from the MTV stunt show Jackass was going to be the voice of Mandrake, most likely to make him more comedic. However, Knoxville backed out, so Mandrake was voiced by Austrian actor Christoph Waltz, and this keeps in line with the blue sky trend of giving actors their first voice role in an animated production, alongside other actors like Amanda Seyfried, the voice of MK, Colin Farrell, the voice of Ronan, Chris O'Dowd, the voice of Grub, Jason Sudeikis, the voice of Professor Bamba, and singers Beyonce Knowles and Pitbull as Queen Tara and Bufo, respectively. Dr. Bamba's house seen in the movie was based on the house called Olana in Hudson, New York, which was inhabited by the landscape painter Frederick Edwin Church. During the advertising for Epic, some people have been seeing the movie as a ripoff of movies like Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, or James Cameron's Avatar. To ease the anxiety, Wedge proclaimed, I hate to associate it with other movies. It is an adventure on the scale of Star Wars, and it does immerse the audience completely in a world like Avatar, but it has its own personality. For the movie score, Danny Elfman, best known for collaborating with horror icon Tim Burton, wrote the music for and on a minor note. This is the second time he wrote music for an animated film based on a William Joyce book. The first was the 2007 Disney movie, Meet the Robinsons. The soundtrack was released on May 21, 2013, three days before the movie. The film had an international release on May 16, 2013, before premiering on May 18, 2013, at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York City, and six days later on May 24, it was released theatrically. The reviews the film got were generally mixed to positive, with critics loving how beautiful the animation is, but criticized the story for its unoriginality. For the box office, it did fairly well as it earned $268.4 million against a budget of $93 million, managing to earn $42.8 million on its opening four-day weekend due to Memorial Day coming out on the Monday after its release. However, it grossed over less money the following weeks due to competition from movies such as Fast and the Furious 6, The Hangover Part 3, and Star Trek Into Darkness and it was overshadowed by other animated movies that came out in later weeks like Pixar's Monsters University and Illumination's Despicable Me 2. For all these reasons, the people at Blue Sky decided to shelve any ideas for a potential franchise Epic could have blossomed into. The song that Beyonce and Australian singer Sia sang for the movie, Rise Up, was and currently is a pretty good song to listen to. Epic also won an award for Best Motion Pictures Sound Editors, and it was nominated for a few Annie Awards, a Black Reel Award, a Casting Society of America Award, a Producers Guild of America Award, a Satellite Award, a Visual Effects Society Awards, and a World Soundtrack Academy Award. Going into my personal thoughts with Epic, I found the movie to be one of Blue Sky's most underrated productions, all things considered, and consider it to be an okay movie, just not up to the point where it's my favorite. Epic may not entirely live up to its namesake, but for what it is, I'd say that it is its own sort of epic, if you catch my drift.